There is a class of LPs that need to write very large checks. Those are vehicles that work for that fund size. Sometimes other folks forget that LPs are not in the same business of risk taking the way that GPs are. You're trying to preserve capital at some level for all the various reasons. There is a logic to if you need to write a hundred or hundred and fifty million dollar check and you want some alpha, but you don't want to risk losing it. Visa, I am so excited for this. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be in your new office. Isn't it nice to do it in person? This is so much nicer than Riverside or any online platform. Now, I want to start that just baseline, as blunt as I can be. Like, who are you and what do you do? Well, I'm Pizar. <laughs> Lovely to meet. <laughs> Lovely to meet, you know, many years after first meeting. So I manage Sapphire Partners, which is the LP strategy of Sapphire. And we invest in early stage venture funds, US, Europe, and Israel. And that's what I do. Okay. So you've been an LP for many, many years, and you have the chance now to cool yourself up the night before your first day as an LP. Knowing what you do now, what would you advise yourself? I would say really understand the importance of the power law, which I know sounds like a bit of a nitty gritty. And I'd gotten this advice from other LPs, which is the difference of having a power law defining company in your portfolio and the experience of that for the GP along with the entrepreneur really changes the understanding of how venture works. And you really just can't, or maybe you can, we just haven't seen a fund that sort of and in the early stage, onesie, twosies it to outperformance. It's hard to walk that until you really feel it. And then you see these activities, you see the companies taking off, you see the difference and what it looks like to have that kind of a power driver in your portfolio. I have so many things to unpack from such a small segment. Uh, this will be a short show. Uh, onesies <laughs> and twosies it to outperformance. What do you mean by that? Well, some, it, if you think of a growth stage portfolio, it's not that one doesn't want to have a power law company and have it return 100x and be two to three times your, your fund. It's just much harder when you have a large fund. So a lot of those funds end up having a number of exits then end up adding up to driving performance. In a early stage fund, if you we've yet to see a fund that's returned three or more x that does not have a company that's returned at least one time the fund. And that's what I mean by like you can't do the single and base hits like, oh, I got a 2x on this deal. I got a 3x on that deal. Those are all great to add to the portfolio. But if you don't have a fund returner or a couple half fund returners, it's we haven't seen a fund that's hit out performance. Speaking of the importance of power laws within portfolios there, I often think that actually LPs are too diversified given the breadth of like venture portfolios, 30 to 50 companies most often. If you have 10 man Managers, you have 300 to 500 underlying portfolio companies. I mean, that's a lot of diversification. Do you think that LP portfolios are too diversified? Or do you actually think that they're not diversified enough, given the importance of having just one of those power law? LPs are like snowflakes. No two are the same. So <laughs> some people do like diversification. I know some LPs that specifically look at the overlaps or the lack of overlaps between their managers. And what they really are trying to do is they cover the seed market for exactly this point. And they want to make sure if they catch something, it happens. And then what the LP does is sort of a look through on the math and says, well, what if I'm putting X dollars into this fund and they're putting Y dollars into this company, what needs to be true for those companies to be productive on my side. And I know other people that say, hey, I think this area is really interesting. So I'm fine if I've got two or three managers that invest in the same area and even in the same company, because if they hit one, it's going to be that much more productive. And it really comes down to how the LP wants to build their portfolio. Do you think about it in buckets? I see so many LPs that think about it through like, oh, I need early stage consumer. I need you know, series A and B enterprise. Do you think about it through that bucket? Lens? Well, we just do early stage. So we, which in our definition, that means we started out originally with series A and we've now moved down into seed and pre-seed. So within that area, we then look at what is the overall underlying um, distribution of companies that we have. Like, do you want a lot of deep tech? Do you want some climate? Do you want consumer and enterprise? We tend to think in the consumer and enterprise as who's the end user of the goods or software versus too many more specifics within it. And we've just done a lot of research in consumer enterprise and looking at how they return, how they grow. And you can get compelling exits in both, but they have different dynamics. So we want to make sure we have enough to capture those. Don't we be more specific? Is no, this for the jet lags kicking no, in? No, not at all. I'm just <laughs> laughing because I'm thinking like consumers fun, but B2B makes money. We are... Um, proud venture geeks, and we do publish some of our findings. So last year, we re-ran our consumer enterprise report. It's out there on our website if you want to look at it. And enterprise does tend to have more consistency of exits, but you get the big spikes in the consumer ones. So if you, a Coinbase, for example, you don't get 10 of those at the same time historically. The world could be different in the future. What we saw in 2020 to 2022 
again, you had the Coinbase, you had a couple more. If you got out when Peloton stock was high, like there were ways of making money, but it's not as consistent as the enterprise. So we do want both in our portfolio, but we're conscious of the of the exit dynamics. When we look at like Uber, you're like, wow, this wasn't in the schedule, Harry, thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> jet lag and like just meandering journalist or you know, interviewer. But like, you know, when you look at Warby Parker, when you look at Away, when you look at um, Allbirds, when you look at Hymns, which actually performed relatively well in public markets, but still, like Sam Lesson said on the show that actually a lot of these companies show that early stage venture models that have been so prevalent don't really make sense. Even your Robin Hoods of the world, which were supposed to be you know, 30, 40 billion. I think Robin Hoods is seven now, which is, which is great. And I'm not at all, but it's not what it w- was and what we thought it would be. Do you think Sam has grounding for that? I understand his point. I think from a very specific LP GP perspective, it, it's sort of defined on when you get out of the investment. We have managers that would have potentially sold into some of those later rounds because if they could sell, I'm making up the numbers, but 10 or 25% of their ownership and return a fund or half a fund and still hold some for the upside and then potentially distribute the stock when it's high. Again, you have to wait for your lockup and there's all these parameters that might not make it possible. I mean, if there's a small float, it's also a little bit more tricky sometimes. But you can make money on those deals. Absolutely. I mean, we're going to get into kind of lean in versus lean out. I, I want to start though from the top because there's a lot of negativity and doom and gloom and like no LPs are investing and like, you know, this is the end. Is it true that no LPs are making new commitments? Like, how do you think about that statement? That's not true. I think LPs are being more selective in making new investments. I know we are. I know others that are. They're absolutely making new investments. They're just probably not doing all the data is not in yet, but it doesn't look like the volume of dollars being invested this year into funds is anywhere near like last year. Last year was a very was a peak. So that's not wildly surprising, but they're still making investments. It's the question of like, no, no, no managers are raising though, really. I mean, there's a huge withdrawal in terms of net new manager raisings. Yes, there are still some, but the amount that have come back to market has changed significantly, which might correlate to the reduction in dollars. Correct. Do you think that's fair? I think it's um, kind of all tied together, right? If the entrepreneurs are slowing down their fundraising so that they can produce the metrics necessary to convince a GP to invest, then the GP is going to call less capital and then deploy their funds slower, and then LPs are going to be slower. We saw numbers about like 12 to 18 months, which is historically atypical, right? Usually it's three years. So if now they're lengthening back out to three years, yes, there's fewer funds being raised. And I think there's a lot of, we can get into this or not, of people trying to figure out what is the health of the underlying companies, what's really going on. And there's so many things going on about why LPs are slowing down. A lot of LPs also pre-spent future budgets, if that makes any sense. If you were raising a fund every 18 months and I thought you were raising every three years, I had two choices. Either I pull from future year budgets or I reduce my check so that I stay consistent in my deployment, even if you're raising faster, or I end up spending money or committing money earlier than I anticipated. And then right now, given what's going on in the markets, a lot of LPs are feeling liquidity strains. I wouldn't say a crunch, but there's different demands on those dollars. And so what you're saying is that most actually just pulled forward dollars from the future. They didn't reduce commitment size. People did both. And now they're feeling the pain. Correct. Because you also, what you have at the same time is not only is people that are existing established venture investors know that it can take 10 years for an exit to happen. Like that's not a surprise. But if you've built a portfolio and you've got publics and privates and other areas You can manage your liquidity by taking money from other places as it comes in. But if the exit markets are generally shut for everybody, you're not getting your privates, your private equities necessarily distributing capital. So you can't use that to make your capital calls either. And you don't want to sell your stock when it's down if that's not part of your strategy. So there's just a lot of varying things going on that are hitting budgets. And a lot of LPs that manage endowments or foundations have a annual budget that they have to spend money on, right, for whatever their business is. So they still need to figure out how to make those payments. Yeah. And like mandated outflows for scholarships Correct. or for university reimbursements or Correct. for like educational grants or whatever. Correct. I'm like, thank God I didn't go to university. <laughs> so I've sat through multiple investment committee sessions with um, larger funds, so larger LPs managing multiple funds who are looking at, well, how do you manage this? We keep. You also have liquidity profiles that you have to keep. Like you can't be too illiquid because it violates their rules. And just where are you going to, you know, clip your coupon, so to speak? So, so again, so many things. I've met quite a few endowments who are thirty-five percent plus weighted in venture, which I thought was like blisteringly high. It made me happy as a venture manager. I think all LPs should be that high, but I was like, wow, that's a lot. Where do you think it's kind of reasonable? I think everybody has to pick based on to your point their liquidity 
profile. Profile, and then you know what do they want to do, and what kind of returns are they striving for? So it's it's hard to give a common answer. I do know when a lot of endowments started looking at the Yale model, and being willing to go very long on that, they shifted to that, and maybe some people are rethinking it. I do know there are some managers, some LPs. When I, sorry, when I say managers, who are like, we're just going to have to pause for a bit while it rebalances, which also has its own dangers. I mean, there is a very long history of looking at venture returns, which says if you're not in the market, you, you just don't know how to call the exit. So you have to be consistent about committing. But if you have a bunch of existing managers who are still putting money in the ground, you could probably skip a year and still have money going in, just not be re-upping or making new investments. The hard thing is if you skip a year and you skip a year on the best managers, they're not going to take you back. Correct. That is one of the concerns. So what do you do then? Everybody has to decide. Some people just make it work with a smaller check or they take it from somewhere else. Some LPs will say, we believe we can get back in later. Some LPs are have to exit. Okay. This has gone more direct, but this is great. In terms of the liquidity problem, what do we think happens then? Because I take actually a longer view. I don't think IPO windows will open for longer than people think. Jason Jason thinks, thinks it's back half of next year. And he's that got 100K was... bet with me on it being the back half of next year. One a week for the back half of next year. I thought <laughs> my mother's going to love this Chanel shopping. I love how much you love your mother. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she loves Jason with that deal. Trust me. Uh, but I think it's going to be longer. Like, you know, it. Uh, you'll see it in the update coming out this weekend. But it's like, you know, data breaks, Stripe. It's not going to be enough to actually crack open the IPO markets like we think it will be, I don't think. And I don't think they'll come out next year. And so I think it's going to be like you know, H2 2025. So what do we do then when liquidity is actually that far away? It's going to be tough. I mean, people will probably have to keep tightening their belts. I mean, we've seen this before. It took a number of years post 2000. It did take about three years um, to correct and for venture to come back in. And there was just a lot less money being committed to funds. And so you'll see a winnowing out. But you also, as a fund manager, yeah. if you wanted to wait an extra two years before you raised, you can. I mean, yeah. as long as you can pay your rent and do whatever you need to do with your money, and you can, you know, how long you can afford to work without management fees or whatever from a new fund, then no one's telling you you have to stop. You can still manage your portfolio and wait till it develops and then come back. Do we think we'll see strip sales? Do we think we'll see selling fund positions? I'm seeing fund positions now being 80% discount. I mean, like, it's a great time to be a buyer. Yes, we are seeing that coming together in the market. I think the challenge is exactly what you said. Somebody wants an 80% discount and the person selling might not want to sell at an 80% discount. So I think the market is still hasn't fully connected. Yeah. I think we're seeing some, the tip of the iceberg. And if the market doesn't come back, there could be a lot more. And that is when, to your point about when endowments and foundations and other LPs have to make some really hard choices about what they keep in their portfolio and what they don't. Do you think emerging managers who have maybe some really promising, exciting early positions that they could sell, but at a steep discount, should they sell them to get the DPI to raise the next funds? Or should they stay true, hold them because they are long-term winners, but then have TVPI, not DPI? That is a tough question. Can we start with an easier one? <laughs> <laughs> it's a misalignment between GP and LP that we don't talk about. We can totally talk about all. There's, a, there's, well, misalignment. I think it depends on where you sit. Your question is interesting because if you, if it's really one of your breakout companies, I don't know if you're, if you had a conversation with your LPs. I guess my best advice would be, and we can cut to the point about the good advice. I think my advice would be to sit down with your LPs and understand what they're thinking because if it is a strong best company, it needs another year or two to get through the storm or whatever is happening in the public markets. But say you have an open AI in your portfolio or an absolute kind of a home run, but actually you need DPI and actually to get that next cohort of LPs to expand the fund size, the fund size you want, we can get onto fund size expansion, but it happens, you need to do the sale. I now, bet is, some will. And, but again, to the point of if you can sell 10 or 20%, let's say you got in, what was, what was open AI's first round? I have no idea. I have no idea, but it was not a hundred billion, right? Isn't no. It? So whatever it was some some smaller number. Yeah. And if you could then sell in the hundred billion dollar round and fifty x your money, twenty x your money, that doesn't sound any different from what we've said in the past, which is that people sell into these high rounds and make money. That's not illogical. It doesn't, but there's a misalignment when you know that you're selling advantageously early for DPI to get the next fund when it's against the long term interests of your LPs who actually just want long term like value accrual. Are you asking, are they going to sell their whole position? No, but if you sell any of your position, it is. Mm, I don't know. I think I could take the other side of that. I think 10 or 15% is not going to take some money off the table. If it's going to return your fund, 
that's meaningful. No, I, I totally agree with you. And I would recommend that you do do that. Yeah. But if you were an LP, actually, who believes in the position like many would do an open AI, they would rather you hold it. All of it, 100%. Yeah. I would say that in this last six months, I've heard more LPs that say, used to say, say, it's like anything on Twitter. If people say, hold on to your winners, there's usually a sub bullet that's not making its way out on Twitter. But like, so I think originally when a lot of that language was stated, it was because people were selling dramatically earlier, right? At like, I'm going to make up numbers, but let's say 200 million or 400 million versus 10 billion or 5 billion or even a billion. But the idea of taking some money off the table is not... Those two are not wild, are not diametrically opposed. And I've heard LPs that used to say, hold on to all your winners all the time are now saying, well, I, I meant that. But in context, there are times when it could be useful. It's amazing how context is used. You, you mentioned kind of the, the tightening selection for uh, LPs in terms of the managers they back and who they're invested with. What's changed in terms of what they want and what they don't want? I think today you want to see what you've always wanted to see in the past, but people released a bit on the aperture around it, which is you want to see people that are going to be getting into great companies, good fiduciaries, and managing their team. I don't think it's actually different. I just think back when it was sort of this big run up in the in the when we were in the bull market, it looked like there were a lot more nodes and areas that could be very productive, and people went for it because they didn't. There's a lot of FOMO, LPs and GPs alike. And now on the other side of that, a lot of it looks like it was a lot of momentum and it may or may not convert. And now people are reconsidering, well, if in down markets, do I want to reconsider how I'm doing this and what the same three buckets, but maybe I need to be a bit more astute about what they mean to me. Well, we see a lot of LPs not do fun twos of GPs they got exuberant with in the boom times and not do the fun twos they would have normally done. If you're an institutional LP coming into a fund one, I'm going to caveat this and say most of the Institutional LPs I know that do fund ones tend to do spin outs. And then the LP base is usually more institutional than the fund one that's coming up out of Angel List, yeah. just to draw a comparison. So I think those institutional fund ones from day one will have a much easier time raising fund two because most LPs who have been in the venture business for a while know that there is only so much you can show in two to three years of work. Yeah. So barring something going really awry, a change in strategy, a breakdown in team, whatever, something really falling apart, they will do fund two because you just will not have enough data to know unless, until fund three. Yeah. I think it's different for the smaller, newer funds. What's insane though is I was brought up on the, the three-year deployment cycles and fund three is your fund where you prove it or you're out. Not true when you're deploying in 12 months and your fund three is actually three years in. Correct. So you might see some more wobbles, but I would say even for some of those funds, I've seen other LPs come in to fill it or they're taking down their fund size. So there's ways of managing that is my is my point. But I think you see it more, I'm seeing more fund threes and fund fours where this is coming up as a conversation because you do have a bit more data and you're trying to think through the pacing of it. Do you think we'll see people reduce fund size? We already are. Like proactively in across all segments? I'm just looking at the early stage, but the growth has been very- You're seeing it in early? Correct. From 100 to 50, say? Mm. Not quite that dramatic, but maybe it's not 250, maybe it's 150. The math kind of goes two ways, which is if the round sizes are getting a little bit more decreased or they can go earlier, they can find other ways. I think people are pulling it in. I don't think you can though. I mean, seed pricing is higher or as high as it's ever been. Depends on where you're shopping and who you are. This is true. I would mean, I don't need to detail this. I mean, all of the good journalists are out there detailing all the large growth funds and their changes in sizes for us. So those are, <laughs> <laughs> those are, those are known and out there. Yeah. I think we're seeing this and, and interested in your thoughts on this, like a movement away from the billion dollar plus funds in the realization of just how hard it is to do like good numbers on those. And then also a movement away from the sub $100 million where it's like, it's quite a lot of work to underwrite them. There's not a huge amount of data. There's definitely no DPI and there's not the established brand. I, you could get fired if you recommit and it's a dud. Let's just go in the middle. Let's go for the 300 to 700 solid. We can get good numbers with good DPI, with good teams, game on. That's where I'm seeing the concentration of capital. Yes. I hear the same thing. I hear a lot from LPs. I would like to be able to write a 20... $25 million check. I want to be able to grow it over time. I want somebody who's up and coming, so not too large and potentially whatever comes up with a large platform, too big of a fund size, or maybe it's too diffused, or maybe it's too many strategies for their taste. But I don't want to take a ton of risk on not knowing if they can't pick. That's Goldilocks. I mean, yeah. it's lovely. We like that too, right? There's all sorts of positive things there. But if you hadn't, if you weren't in them earlier, it's hard to sometimes to get in then because the existing LPs 
are thinking the same thing. Totally. Right? So there's a little bit of timing muddle on that. And then there aren't that many because a lot of them, a lot of the folks that were in that size have grown up into bigger funds. And so unless they, to your point, unless they want to have their fund size or whatever, 40% lower, I don't know if they'd go back out and raise that because they also have people in their firm that want to build their careers and want to invest capital. So if you decrease your fund size, that has material impact on what your investing team is doing. 100% it does, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, which, fund si which fund within that bracket are you not in that you wish you were in? Well, there's a number of funds that were launched way before we were born that have are obviously lovely and wonderful. That I give you a magic wand, you can invest in anything. Oh, if I could go back in time and be like, you know, one of the first LPs in Benchmark and Sequoia, yeah, I'd do that all day long. Yeah? Yeah. In the 300, 700 size. Well, they started out smaller than, I uh, can't remember their first fund sizes. Yeah, so but benchmark would have been yeah. in that range. Yeah. I think when they first started, they were like 100 or something. Wow, right? that well, they started fund. in 95. I mean, this was all pull back the dollars, the right? year before I was born. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So if I came out of college and started becoming an LP the next day. So are we going to see a pull away from the large multi-billion dollar funds? There is a class of LPs that need to write very large checks. Those are vehicles that work for that fund yeah. size. We also have to understand, I mean, I know you get this, but it's, I think sometimes other folks forget that LPs are not in the same business of risk taking the way that GPs are. You're trying to preserve capital at some level for all the various reasons. So there is a logic to if you need to write a hundred or $150 million check and you want some alpha, but you don't want to risk losing it, why the larger vehicles can be a place to put your money. And actually return rates comparative across like macro industries where it's compared across real estate, it's compared yes. across credit, da, da, da. Yes. you're 12 to 15 cents, actually not bad. It can, yes, the 7% interest rate market is playing with it a little bit, but but take, just wave a magic wand and take that out of the equation. There is that way of, there is that way of looking at it because you can't, if, I have to, if I'm an LP that has to write a $100 million size check, unless you want to be 100% of a fund, like you just, you can't do it. It's really hard. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. Do you think we'll see the death of micro funds? We saw so many five to fifteen million dollar angel list funds where everyone was doing a fund. I had one call where I was pitched a company and a fund by the founder in the same meeting. Oh, so we've done reference calls with CEOs that pitch us their fund in the same yeah. meeting. Yeah. I mean, it's just like <laughs> we haven't seen it yet. And I really don't wish the death of the micro funds. We are big believers in the power of small vehicles and that it can work. Yeah. I think also what you have in the market today, as you mentioned, Angelus, there are platforms where if you want to raise a five or $10 million fund, you can. And that's individuals. That's not really an institutional fundraise. But you also have a number of VCs who have built really replete LP programs, right? And that have 50 plus, um, they've made investments in 50 plus VCs. And granted, these are deal sourcing strategies. They aren't necessarily uh, do, launching do you guys funds. Buy that? Like, if you are investing in a fund for a deal sourcing strategy as a VC, you should hang up your boots. Like that is a that's that's like admitting defeat. Um, I will go on record and say that. I don't know. I think there's quite a few. I think some people do it. I think it's it's hard, right? The as someone who invests in funds for a living, it's hard. There's a lot more to it than it looks on the outside. If nothing alone, it's the how do you manage the data? What's the administration of it? How do you show up? And if you're trying to your point, understand what 300 or 400 underlying companies are doing from a deal sourcing capability, you need to have your tools in place to do that. And or if I was doing direct deals at the same time as doing fund investments, you can show up and it's the same brain, so it's a little bit easier. Yeah. So I've seen people do some pretty interesting strategies around that. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see how many deals come out of it that they find really useful. I mean, back in the day, like the Sequoia Scout program was very famous for them. And your data, it was, but actually there was a big problem, which is like their data monitoring wasn't what it could have been. And so they missed a lot of A's and B's and then did the C's of companies that they did scout deals in. And so ultimately, yes, they got great returns on the scout check, but they missed a huge amount of alpha in the middle because they didn't have the data monitoring. And when you invest in 20, 30, 40 funds and they have 30 companies each, you've got, you know, 500 plus companies. Correct. No, I, no joke. We understand we have thousands of underlying mm. companies. It is a real challenge if you're trying to monitor that for deal flow. Plus, Oh, we can bring the entrepreneur into this conversation. I don't know if they solve the same way, which is, well, just because so-and-so is an, L an LP in my GP's fund, I therefore am going to pick that GP. No. Do you know what I mean? I think they probably solve they for who they think is going to be the best investor for their business. Yeah, who they like to work with, the personality match, what they bring. Yes. No, I totally agree. I think it's challenging. But I do think one of the upsides to that, regardless of whether or not it's working out for the VC doing that program, a lot more smaller funds have been able to st be stood up because they have. And I've seen decks where really all of the LP capitals come from other venture funds or other venture 
people as yeah. either as individuals or off the fund size, fund the fund um, dollars. And they're now in business. I agree with you there. And actually just on that thread, you mentioned kind of, oh, like the signal that one derives from a certain investor. Yeah. Investors do derive signal from other investors. Which investors derive the most signal or give out the best signal? Is it endowments and foundations? Is it a certain type? I used to have a less nuanced view on that. And you would think, yes, pick a pick a wonderful endowment that is a great name and is a great portfolio. You would say if they invested, obviously it's a great fund. But you have to understand why it works in their portfolio versus our portfolio. And so it's not necessarily playing the same role. And so you have to dig a little deeper and say, well, who are they and why are they doing this? You buy that? Well, we're... I love you, but I'm like... No, I... I know so many where it's like... Oh, I know... Oh, Yale, oh, X are invested. Whoosh. Correct. No, no, it's it's a thing. I'm not saying it's not a thing. We just do our own work and want to have our own opinions. And we we want to understand who's around the table. But we're not going to not... Oh, I know you do. Yeah. But, but, you're, but, but you're, we're you're thoughtful. So, but, <laughs> thank you. Um, we've also built a business that's dedicated to doing this. Yeah. A lot of the other LPs are doing ventures to the earlier conversation against a myriad of things they're doing. And they don't, with some exceptions, have huge teams. So you... People have to pick ways of making decisions. And if they know if they co-invest with whatever endowment or foundation frequently, they probably know them as people. Like there's definitely folks that refer us deals that we co-invest with. And you're like, oh, I know how they process. I know how they think. That at least gives me some level of understanding versus somebody who, when you call them and you say, why did you invest in this fund? And they say, oh, I'm only here for the direct deals. I don't care about the return as much. It's not that it doesn't matter. It just, they're there's not doing it for measures. the fund return. They're trying to write a 30 or $50 million direct check we might like the same fund, but we're liking it for different reasons. Who, when they send you a deal, are you like, ah, oh, right, I'm, I'm, I'm involved. Like, this has got my attention. Harry, everything you send me gets my attention. <laughs> <laughs> but like, there are certain people, like one of your managers, like Mike Chalfin. Mike yep. does very few deals. He's very selective of where he spends his time, and he's really involved when he does. Holy shit! When Mike says to me, "Hey, Harry, I really want your time on this," like, you got it. Yeah. Who is? Oh, I fear if I start naming names, I'm going to forget good people, and that's not fair to them. Um, I wouldn't worry. Well, there's a we we like collaborating with other LPs, so we work with a wide range. I mean, I really don't have a I don't have a simple answer. I'm going to give you like 35 names, and that's just going to be tedious as hell to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> meet, meet, meet the sub scroll. Okay, I totally get you. What's the separator between those that are able to make it from like? Emerging manager fund one to like, oh, wow, blue chip institutions come on, fund two, this is actually happening. What makes a difference? Yeah. Probably a number of things. I do think there is, so there's the whole myth or not myth of the persistency bias in venture, right? If when you're with 20 VC, if you get these wonderful companies, other entrepreneurs can be like, oh, Harry's a great investor. He's got these wonderful other entrepreneurs that I know, these great companies that I know. And so they'll bring you deal flow. And then LPs see that and they say, oh, Harry has this great deal flow. It might not be proprietary deal flow, but it's proprietary access. And then the LPs want to join the party and they come and then that gives you capital to keep going and running your business. And even though Everyone always has a caveat of past performance does not guarantee future. There does seem to be, and there's been a zillion people studying this, so I can't quote them all, but trying to figure out, is there a persistency bias in returns? And that's what drives, again, people have disputed it. People believe in it. You have to pick your side of the table. But enough people invest believing that once you get that flywheel going of the best entrepreneurs coming to you, that they will persist. And that's why the LPs then will also want to work with the same managers and that. So you just need to sort of figure out a way to get that going. Yeah. And it takes a little bit of time. I mean, it's not going to happen. It's it's not that it can't. It's just very hard to do in your first fund cycle <clears throat> because there's just not enough time. The biggest thing I see with that mindset on the cyclicality of success is like we obviously, we've we worked very closely with Sequoia and Founders Fund before. And when I look at like Brian Singerman and Pat Grady, they're not worried at all about it going to zero, but they are very worried about upside maximization. And I think you get that uncapped upside lack of fear of downside through immense success. When you don't have that immense success, you're much more worried about getting fired, so to speak. Well, you just talked about the attitude around power law much better than I did. And yes, I don't I don't disagree with you. I remember um, I used to work at DFJ many years ago, and somebody had this a perspective on Tim Draper. They just said he, he sees fear very differently than the average person does. He's the risk master. He's the risk master. And they just, but it was very... It was a really nice framing of your point about how do you take risk and what's your appetite for risk and how do you think about it. And it's, yes, when you're swinging for the fences, you 
going back to what I said before, it is incredibly hard to be an early stage fund that has outperformance without a couple fund returners. You have to shoot for outperformance. You can't be like, oh, my TAM's five and I'm going to get all of it. Like those That might work in private equity. It might work at growth stage. It does not work if you're trying to drive for outperformance in your fund. Do you have to have ownership to have outperformance? Oh, oh it's such a good topic. Um, <laughs> You've got SV Angel. You can do it. You can certainly do it on a smaller fund. You have to then have a very high hit rate. Or I should say this way, the companies that exit have to exit even bigger vis-a-vis -vis your fund size. So a lot of those funds that have the smaller ownership- When we ownership, say small fund size, we're saying- 40, 45. Okay. I think we've yet to run the math and see a fund that's gone over 50 million that doesn't have to start having some trade-off between ownership and, and AUM. 100%. I mean, again, like you can get, you know, a Coinbase in your fund, and then yeah, it doesn't it moves the dial even if you have a hundred million dollar fund, right? But but it actually doesn't. But, was, but my point is, it actually doesn't. If you well, if you have a fifty saying, billion dollar exit, well, if you have a fifty billion, sure. Correct. But if you have a ten billion, which is no, what it doesn't. Saying, so you're this, locked up, and actually you put a hundred k check in. I don't disagree. At a twenty mil pre, like it is today. Shit, you're zero point five percent on entry. You'll be zero point two five percent on exit. I don't disagree. We've run. I know this sounds so boring. Investing in a fund is art and science, and the science part cleans the deck very. But the art, the art is very hard on the people, right? That's a people business, and you have to go and spend time. But on the math of it, we just underwrite a Series A fund to a three X and C to a five X, and you just look at what the numbers line up at, and you say, okay, so given the ownership and given the AUM, what needs to be true for, to return the fund one time or half a time? And then you say, okay, let's say the number is $2 billion. How many $2 billion exits do you think you're going to get in your fund? And you can tell me what you think. And then, again, history is not always the same. You're going to have, yes, Ten. all of them. Be Ten. awesome. <laughs> but you look at this and you say, okay, to your point, you go back and you look at some very strong performing funds and you say, how many did they have? And what was the percentage of their companies? And you apply that math. And again, like the future could be different, but you realize just how hard it is. It's really hard. Should we be more honest with LPs about our performers and underperformers. I think often managers are a little bit like, you know, oh no, they're they're, you know, they're, they're finding their way. <laughs> no, they're not. It's an absolute shit show. Like we've got no idea what's going on. I think there are ways of saying it that LPs can understand. Right. And that we have managers who are very good at showing us like, hey, here's the ones that we have questions on. Right. They could turn it around. You never know. Here's the metrics. Like you just go through the metrics and you talk about it, what's going on with the teams, and you know where they're at. And venture is a risk business. Like you're not, you don't go into early stage and expect every company to work. And one of the weird things about the market from the last, sorry, 2020 to 2022, we did not as an industry have the loss ratios, even probably back earlier, that one would expect in venture. Like you just had all these companies getting funded so they could continue to try. And that, and then it even became more relevant actually for the, GPs to be able to talk about what was going on in the company. And now there's it's clearer if product market fit's been hit or if companies have just a ton of money and might spend time trying to find it. Do you think Eric Paley is right to say that this will be the biggest chasm ever between TVPI and DPI? The only other time that would be equivalent would be about <clears throat> 99 and 2000. And I don't know if there is the volume of funds in the market then. So and on absolute numbers, he's probably right. And Relatively, you're about five or six then, so we can't get back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that age reduction. <laughs> um, I, it's entirely possible. Yeah. No. So the question then is, how on earth do LPs value their books? I, you know, I meet a lot of LPs and walk around Hyde Park, and they all just going to be, I just don't know what I'm sitting on, Harry. Like, how would you advise me? I know what I say to them, but I'm intrigued to hear first what you say to them. How do you advise LPs on how do you value your books given the ambiguity? Well, I know a lot of LPs that will ask their managers and then go back home and take another 20 to 25% off the top because there's things that nobody knows. And then sometimes you're just, we're just all wrong and something turns around like AI happens and some companies become rocket ships because they've managed to do something with AI that works in the market and other companies not, right? They somehow, the, 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 the AI intelligence software has just so changed the market and what people are looking for that their companies now seem out of date. And it was really strong, but the customers aren't buying the same way because the product doesn't compete as effectively. Do you find that there's a differing level of transparency around book value across managers? Well, everybody shares it. But if what you're asking is, do people value their companies differently? Yes. If you're an LP that has a, as a sort of existing book of venture business and you've got it over different times, you will 100% see that people will value their companies differently. Do you communicate that to the managers who are overvaluing their portfolios? Well, overvalue is a relative term. I mean, they're not going to... Uh, I think if they ask the question, I think one of the things that GPs forget is that they can ask the LPs what they think. 
Do you think they care? They might not. I do know. I do know the auditors. I know. I don't know. They might not. But I'm saying, like, you could ask. You could ask your LPs and say, "Are you seeing these companies being held differently?" And I would like to think the LPs would answer. If so, don't tell me. <laughs> don't tell me. Well, and then I heard stories, and is this is a story? So put it under the rumor and hearsay bucket. But that last year, the end of 2022, when the auditors were getting involved, they were telling GPs to talk to each other to try to figure out how to value things. Because if you weren't close enough to a public comp, you had to value it off of like the last raise, which is a logical method. But if a company had raised three times in 2021 and was, you know, 100x multiple on revenue and the company hadn't grown that much, it raises a lot of questions. Listen, as you know, we get the track record from every GP before they come on the show. The disparity in numbers is enormous. We had one last week, which was a $6 billion company in one book, and then it was sold for about 300 the next week. So let me ask you a question. Was it a seed manager or a series A manager that had the highest holding. It was a series B manager. Oh, okay. That dis disputes my theory because a lot of times seed managers don't, they only might have information rights by the time a series B or C comes up. So they might not have all the information that someone in the boardroom has. I know the series B manager, I think was delaying the notification of that over payment of price. Well, let me tell you another thing. Um, LPs, some get paid on DPI, some get paid on TVPI. Meaning that yeah. that the how they're holding their portfolio is relevant to how they are viewed, not just for their personal paycheck, but how they are how they might be measured by an external U.S. News and World Report, and other things. So if you there's a whole push pull in the market. Does that not completely skew the incentives? Like it, yes. Should that not change? Potentially, but I'm not sure how what the magic wand will be that'll change that. Why would that be? The, I'm I'm like that seems so. Abhorrent is a strong word, but like ineffective to me as an efficient it's, weighing mechanism. Why would why why does it exist? There must be some historical reason. I think it goes back to back in the old days of venture, TVPI didn't rock it up in one year as quickly as it is now. So a lot of these systems were put in place when things were a little bit more prosaic and how they managed along. TVPI used to be a pretty decent signal, not perfect, to, to see what, T, what DPI was coming. That, I would think, to the Eric Paley's point, got a little broken recently because it was just very hard. If your company has raised three times in a year and is now worth $10 billion, and you're a $50 million seed fund, that's a huge change, yeah. right, and up and down. And so there was a number of LPs that were telling their managers, just don't mark it up like, or mark it up a little bit, like be really conservative, but it's hard to then uh, argue to the auditors you can't mark it to the last round if it was like two months ago because the auditors will say, I mean, I can't speak for all auditors, but typically they're like, use the most recent last round if it's in the last six months. Especially if it's a very legitimate top tier firm. Totally. So I, my, my most benevolent answer is a lot of these things were probably put in place when TVPI and DPI were not so dissimilar. And so these things made more sense. And now we just, the last few years made it look really um, just a lot more confused. Are there any other big misalignments? Like, that's a really cool one. I think depending on who you are as an LP, um, the fund size can drive some misalignment, right? To your point about the lar much larger funds and what they're trying to do and how they're trying to create returns and financial stability. And if you're, but that also comes with, and this has been discussed on Twitter ad nauseum, um, if it comes with a lot of management fee, and if you are able to work in a fund and make millions of dollars per year in management fee, P.S. Most LPs do not make millions of dollars per year in salary. Just putting that out there is one of the challenges. Um, some do, do. Some do, but the, I would bet the number of LPs in the market, like you're probably looking at the top tier, like the the top senior people, not all the ones up and down the stack yeah, no, doing so the work. CIOs are the biggest ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for for good reason, right? I'm not saying they shouldn't, but I'm just saying that you don't. That's not a that's not normative. Whereas if you have a fund that's I don't know many billions, you're going to have a number of GPs that are making significant dollars, assuming it's spent not spent on platform and other things. But if you can make that kind of money and without even returning the fund, that's very different from an LP who needs the money back to fund whatever it is they're trying to fund with it. With the stacking of funds, as you said that, like, I have many friends who are doing like 10 plus a year base. Um, 10 million, they're making $10 million a year personally Yeah. from management fees. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you think about you know billion dollar funds stacked yeah. on top of two billion dollar funds stacked yeah. on top of another one yes. and a half billion, this is my plus point. opportunity do you, fund. So do they? Like, how yeah, do, easily. How do they think about creating carry? <laughs> Don't ask the questions, <laughs> my friend. My, <laughs> that's not how this game goes. My question to you is: Do LPs talk about it and go that this is like? Is there retribution for those managers? Because again, I know so many that are just stacking huge fees. Well, this goes to the if you're and an you LP. Must know this. Um, we do not, since we do early stage, 
those those size of funds are not part of our program. So not living it the same way, um, some of the LPs who are investors in those funds, I would presume they can do math. And so they understand what the management fees people are taking home and have figured out a way to be comfortable with it or for whatever reason feel like they still need to be part of the fund. I feel like it's tougher when the funds are smaller and the math is more clear. If you're managing a multi-stage fund and you've got, I don't know, scores of people working there, there's different budget considerations, right? Versus if you're talking about two or three people. But it also depends on if they're generating carry. If they're generating millions of dollars in carry for their LPs, that might be very different. Do you care about fees? I saw you tweeted this like, you know, surveying report. And honestly, I hate the discussion on fees. It's like I hate the discussion on GP commit. It's like, you know, the found yeah. You know, respectfully as many billionaire founders of funds, they can put in a lot more money than me. It doesn't mean they're more committed than I am. It's ridiculous. I agree. I think there's no one number that's, there's no one size fits all. And I definitely think for emerging managers, the management fee and the GP commit need to be looked at in the business case. Like what are they using it for? I mean, I've literally, we've had some funds in our program where I'm a little worried they can't pay their rent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> because you're like, there's no way this management fee can pay for it. So it doesn't surprise me when smaller funds have a 2.5 management fee because you just have fewer dollars. What you typically as an LP like to see is as you layer the funds, the funds, the fees come down or you stop pulling fees on some vehicles. But again, it's, always in the context of what's the fund trying to do, how many people are there, what are the cost structure. And to your point about GP commit, yes, it has been an unnecessary barrier to entry for too many GPs. I'm amazed by how many funds get away with 3 and 30 now. Well, yeah. Shocking, huh? It's impressive. It makes it very expensive. Yeah. It makes it as an LP if you're doing the math on what needs to be true because the, the money you get back is net of all that, right? And so they've had to be able to recycle to, to make up for that. And then also it's expensive. Have you ever had a manager where you've said, hey, this is the benefits of being small, you should stay small? Have you ever had them go, yeah, you're right. I'm going to do that. Yes. <laughs> Who is that? They're, they're shining a light as like the beacon of like... I can't name names. I haven't asked their permission. But um, no, we know many... We actually, I take that back. We have many managers in our portfolio who are very thoughtful about their fund size. And we might have a difference of opinions of like 25 to 50 million here or there, but they're willing to have the... They, they're thoughtful about it first, I think, is the difference. And then if you can have a conversation and say, well, well how are you thinking about this and what's your return profile? Like you, you get at all the important points. I think you and me have a different view of what fund size you need to do a seed fund today. Well, I would say, well, I, <laughs> I, I don't disagree. Dinner. It also depends on if you're leading or if you're a part of a syndicate. Like there's all different strategies, totally. right? But I think if you're leading seed rounds today, you can't have less than $100 million. I agree. But then you need to be leading and getting what we're seeing mm -hmm. is leading and getting low 10, 9 to 11 to 12 percent ownership. A thousand percent agree. But many people raise bigger funds and have 5 percent ownership yeah, or 3 percent. And then yeah. I. Mm -hmm could do the math and I, you end up with the like, well, then now you need this very large exits, which I wish everyone gets. Like there's no button, there's no shortage of wishing this works, but it just historically, you're like, well, you're going to have an incredible batting average. Yeah. And again, we, we want that to be true. That would be lovely. History would argue that's very unlikely. Okay. A manager's getting ripped apart for the deployment timelines because 12 months was, I mean, that was fast. I think there's been many conversations with LP suggesting GPs slow their role. How's that responded to, do you think? Well, you also at the same time were GPs. Because I thought they would pull like, hey, that was completely ill-disciplined. And actually, as a result, we, we can't be a part of it. We, we spent our budgets. I'm so sorry, but we can't be. But they continue to reinvest. If a fund came to you in the beginning and said, we're going to do an annual raise, I know some funds who say this, and the LPs understand it, and they sign up for it, then they understand That's they totally sign up for cool. it. Yeah. So I see that happening. Yeah. I see a lot of other funds saying, you know, this is going to be a two to four year raise, or the LPs are like, hey, we'd like to see, we'd like to see a bit more traction in your companies, could you delay your fundraising or just slow it down and see what happens? Give it another six months. Like getting through this market to our earlier conversation is not going to be necessarily easy and seeing how it rolls. I think those conversations are happening. I don't. You, you don't think they're happening. No, no. I just see, I have speak to so many LPs and like, yeah, I mean, God, Bees has spent that money fast, didn't she? Yeah, yeah we're, doing their new, we're doing their new fund for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, wow. well, okay. okay, why do you think they're doing that? Because I think they're very uncomfortable to have a tough conversation. Um, I think managers actually are very good at making LPs, LPs feel quite scared about pulling out. You won't be allowed back in. I'll blacklist your name in the industry. It's not. I think there's a real power coercion game. Um, I think there's that. Um, I think there's a fear of missing out. Yep. There's always the Facebook 2005 fund. 
There and, always is. That and, example comes I mean, up all the time. <laughs> it's just a cracker, isn't it? And, but it, it is true. But it's fair. And, and, it's a good example. And so, and so I think, and then I also think actually the incentive mechanism within LPs is completely broken in the large part, which is like actually I'm never going to get fired for doing, you know, red point or CRVs now it's fund. Correct. You don't get fired for buying IBM and many, f and this is sort of, um, I'm using Chris Duvos's line, so I always want to give credit when I'm stealing somebody's Mula words. In the no, I was not going to say Mula I in the I tweet cooler, it every day. But, I get away but, with this copyright. <laughs> I owe him so much money. No, he talks about is someone um, is someone sort of investing the capital that they're really a manager of, or are you sort of an employee of a firm? And you need to manage the business. So it's not saying they're not making thoughtful decisions, but it's a different viewpoint if you're like, oh, I'm going to be here for three years. Do you know the average CIO is like a five-year tenure? Yeah. I, did, I actually thought there was like 15 years. Yeah. I, but no, a friend of mine was like, oh, no, it's three to five years. Oh, yeah, they really bounce, which which I find incredible because it's like, how on earth do you know if they're any good? I mean, I've, I've met quite a few where a three-year period and they've had four. And it's like three, four, Correct. three years since, four times. Correct. Gosh. No, but it goes to your point, which is then if you're not those, I'm not picking on those individuals, but I'm saying if you're then in the stack and you're working for a firm and you're deploying capital as an LP, you're taking, you might be taking a different risk appetite yeah. than if you're someone who's like, hey, listen, we're going to go find the next amazing fund and we're going to be with them for a long time. And this is a very different mentality. Do you find it hard not doing a new manager's new fund? Not doing a new manager's? Uh, when, when you have to you know, not do a new fund and you've been in prior funds. How oh, it's very hard. How do you have that discussion? It's delicate. You like to have reasons. We usually try to find, if we don't, we should have good reasons to start with. So you, that is like the first principles of it. And then you share your you share your thinking. You say, here's what needs to be true for us to be able to come back. And we want to come back, but. I always remember Mark Evans told me, you're never wrong to do the right thing. And I always think of that and I'm like, you know, well then how, what is the right thing? And I said this to an LP the other day, which is like, I'd like literally print out the portfolio and you show them the trust that you have and say, listen, this is where you rank. I'm making this out of pure data. And that is why I'm not going to be able to recommit to you. And I'm really sorry. Correct. We've we've shown people TVPI charts and say we have to choose based on productivity. And it's not that we don't believe in you. It's just taking longer. Or some people graduate out of our program because they become they they get launched, for example, right? So we'll do emerging and established. But if you're going to go on and raise a 1.5 billion dollar fund or something, that's outside of our program. Yeah. So we celebrate that. I mean, they may not be. We, we think that's great that they've grown up and done that. But that's not in our program. Final one. We mentioned kind of um, feedback to GPs on you know, deployment timelines. In terms of feedback to GPs on distributions, whether to hold, whether to sell. I think we've been lied to for a generation where it's like lean in, lean in, and the best strategically lent out over time. Is there retribution from LPs who are saying, managers, you didn't take anything off the table in the good times? I don't know if they're saying this to their GPs, but you hear a lot of people having concerns that they're now going to ride the TVPI all the way back down. To your point, you can manufacture some distributions, right? Like you can find if a company's not working, I think managers are now, I'm having more conversations with more managers who are like, hey, we're just going to try to find some soft landing for these companies. It's just not going to work, yeah. which we've been expecting for years to my point about loss ratio. So that doesn't wildly surprise us, but you're not going to 3X your fund that way, yeah. right? You'll retain more than zero, but it'll, you know, it kind of creates fodder on the bottom. I don't, you can't force a company to go public. But when you have a chance to sell secondaries, when you have a chance to distribute. I think there, I, I really do think these conversations are happening either with the GPs or amongst the LPs. I hear people talking about it. Yeah. Um, and just sort of understanding, understanding why the manager did or didn't. And is that, is there a cogent reason for whatever, whatever that reason is, it makes sense. Like there is there, there are definitely times when there are small floats. And if you sell, it could be detrimental to the company. I there are other times when it sort of gets at the, are you going to, are you a fiduciary in the kind of way that I want to be associated and people will make choices? And then there are always going to be some managers that have that kind of LP pull that people will just keep working with. Yeah, I agree. But I think, that, I think that list is getting smaller and I think the names are switching around. Which names are the hottest? Well, I'm going to give a shout out. PitchBook just did a new ranking for their, for based on, I'm not sure what metrics they pulled. It was like capital calls versus distributions. And I don't know how they knew this, but Union Square had the first and the third spot. Mm. So shout out to them. I think Founders Fund, having a moment in the sun, and then just index for consistency of DPI. Yes. Fuck. <laughs> well played. Right. We're going to do a quick fire round. 
Okay. So what do others not know that you know to be true? Okay. I'm going to kind of take a sideways answer to this. I hate being told something's not possible and that you can't do it just because it, just because someone hasn't done it before doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means it's harder. You are a case in point on this, right? I mean, what you've been taking to the market with the intermix of media and venture hasn't been done before. People have tried it in different respects, but haven't nailed it the way you have it. I'm sure, I'm sure millions of people told you it couldn't be done. What would you change about the world of LPs? Oh, I wish the LPA was better. That's such a small little widget. The LPA answer. was better? Was better. It's so hard to read. It's so complicated. It's so not useful. It's supposed to be a tool to understand how our relationship works. And it's just a big legal pile of documents. And I always find by the time you get to the granulars of like what happens if there's a fire and a, a grenade, yeah. you're fucked anyway. <laughs> yeah. So this is, I know it's more of a tactical answer, but I think some of these things just end up being log jams in the ecosystem. And the point is, that's just not the point. If you get to that place, it's it's a big mess anyway. So. What would you guys change in the world of managers most? I really wish managers, the, the great managers understand this, that who they are as an investor and how they build their firm is so specific to them. And then I really do think there has to be that interplay of the two of them for it to become a great firm. And I think a lot of people don't realize that and they think it's just a an easy business to pop up. And it can be, but then that's a smaller business and it's not necessarily going to become a long enduring firm. You said pop up. That I just think everyone misunderstands just how long this is. Everyone says 10 years. It's not 10 years. It's like 15, 20. And that's just one fund. Yeah. Let's be clear. That's one fund. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. It is. I mean, it's sort of this, I find it actually a bit mind boggling that people, it's it's long term. I mean, if you want to have a pop-up business, do something direct, right? Because even then it's not short. Like go a job can be four or five years and you can try different things, right? With the way compensation and equity structures work. But becoming a GP, like, yeah, it is. Assuming you're not doing off Angelus and it's not a small endeavor, if you're trying to bring in other people and other LPs, it's a very wide financial services business. What's the biggest manager miss you've had? Oh, this kills me. So I passed on the initialized fund one because we had just launched. Yes, I know. I know. It was bad. Um, but Do you know, it the made reason, I know, I know. Million. No, trust me, I know. But we were Series A and we were looking for 75 to $200 million fund sizes and they were sub 10 and seed. So it was outside of scope. But I, I maybe, get it. But it's, it's it was outside of scope. Reason, yeah. So it's, so it's, it's a, way outside of scope. It was a, it was a, and we'd, we were early. So doing the, do a couple of things being super exceptions early on. But to the point of, ex, to, I'm going to quote Nikhil from your last podcast with him from Footwork, exceptions should be made for exceptional people. And yes, to this day, that always sticks in my head. What's the strongest belief you had, which turned out to be wrong? We've definitely tested a bunch of hypotheses and different things. And this would then go to the, I just, I keep going back to this, but it's so clear in early stage, if you're not taking a big swing for the fence, which doesn't mean saying taking like ridiculous, I haven't thought about it risks, yeah. right? But you just have a lot of people that think that they can do sort of smaller investments. Like <clears throat> I call the growth equity mindset in the smaller earlier fund, which probably can work in some scenarios. And it works for some LPs that want to do direct investments. I just don't think that's where you're going to get the long-term performance. If you're investing in a sub $50 million fund, what's a good performance? If it's seed, we're going to try to underwrite to a 5x. Yeah. Because people throw out big numbers. You often hear that. I, you know, I'm going to definitely going to be a 10x. I don't, it's like, do you know how freaking hard it is to do a 10x site? There's so nah. many fewer of those than people thought. So I, I appreciate because TVPI looked bonkers. Yeah. The last few years, people thought it looked different. But I think maybe this is the value of being old. I mean, I've been playing in venture in some form or another since 2000. And I was doing emerging markets in 94 for project finance. And I can tell you, it is hard. Who are the most consistent DPI returns? Oh, well, you'd have to pull into so many different books. But I think it's, I think the numbers will tell you if you ask different LPs, if you can get three or four funds in a row with strong DPI, that is world class. Yeah. Usually there's a fund or two which has a, has a tougher time. Yeah. And that can happen. Like, no surprise, 2021 might be a tough vintage. Someone once told me that LPs invest for a banger of a fund a meh fund, and they're aware that there's going to be a dog fund. That's not untrue because there's sometimes things just mess. But if there's consistency elsewhere, there's consistency of theme, consistency of thinking, consistency of team, just going back and asking different LPs in their portfolios, it's very hard to have three or four funds in a row that'll be called a 3x. Does that rule still hold true 
Or do you think people are much more fun by fun dependent? Um, I don't know, actually. Your oh, I don't, I don't know. To our conversation before, institutional LPs, this is why they don't make a lot of new bets every year is because they're looking for managers they think they can be with over multiple fund cycles. But I can tell you if you want me to digress into graduation rates, we've been looking at data going back to 1995. I was shocked at the breakage. The breakage between fund one and fund two is not every year, but averages out to be about 50%. 50%? 50%. Well, again, because we've got the law of large numbers coming in at fund one, there's so many smaller funds. And the reason for that is because these small fund LPs, often being individuals, don't scale into institutions. Yeah. Sometimes people don't realize the fact that you're making, if I'm making a personal commitment every two or three years, that can be expensive and you might not understand that. It could be the GP themselves don't really want to do it. It could, I mean, there's a myriad of reasons, right? What was also sort of heartbreaking was the fund one to fund four on average, again, these are averages, some years were better, some years were worse, is 17%. So it's not a slam dunk, but even if you get to- That a, doesn't surprise me as much. It doesn't surprise me as much. What I think is also interesting is just, and it's a, if you play out one fund one to fund eight, the numbers are terrible because you've got such large breakage in the early years. But even if you get to a fund four, there's still pretty significant breakage going on to the other years because then performance can be seen. What's and then a, what's team What's a bigger succession. reason for funds to not make it, do you think, from fund one to fund four, team breakage and partnership breakdown or performance? Back in the day, if you had three years between funds, you're talking about a decade of investing. So I think performance would be able to be being seen along, and then tied into that is like strategy and all those things. And then I think team, it's very, very hard to do this because you, you no one documents it. But you could see we ran the numbers on funds that from every year, who was the one that has gone on to raise the most vehicles, core vehicles, not all the other layered. If they went multi-strategy, we didn't track all that. A, I was shocked the fund sizes didn't balloon as much as I thought they would because the dollars were going into these other growth vehicles. But you see these funds that got to you know fund four, five, six, and then never raised another fund. And it was, oh, it would have to be some combination of team and track record. Maybe you did so well, you didn't want to keep going. I mean, there's there's the there's the positive side of that, which is it's good. Roger Ehrenberg, peace out. <laughs> which I think we should celebrate more as an industry. Amazing, it's fantastic, and it's and it's great. And I mean, to our point about it's 15 years per fund. I mean, this is like a body of work for 30, 40 years. That is a long time to do one job. People should be allowed to stop. Do LPs mind opportunity funds? I think you have to ask each one. I'm always surprised at the, the different view around, the different viewpoints around the room on any given opportunity fund. I know some people that do it to try to get into the core fund, yeah. right? It's their segue in. They used to be, oh, the other thing we're seeing in this market is people are unstapling yeah. their funds because a number of LPs felt dragged into it to the point of, I want to support you. I'm not so excited about this other vehicle, but I want to support you. So I'll write a smaller check or I'll cut it or I think I just beat up the microphone. But- <laughs> Yes, I think it's a combination of things. And I think that's also why fund four to seven has the same challenges. And people also, you have to bring up the next generation. And people management, if you're doing deals, who in the firm is also thinking about people management and people training? All these things come into play that is much more about managing a firm than just investing. But you need to do both if you're going to be that kind of long-term. Will we see unstapling continue, do you think? Um, I would suspect for at least the next 12 months. Hmm. To the extent that people feel pressure to raise, they're going to try to be more LP aligned. And if folks don't want to do it, there's a couple in the market now. SUSE very publicly tweeted about changing. It's not an opportunity fund per se, but changing out their, I think they had two funds and now they're having three. They're raising independently. So folks are looking at it and talking about is it. Is this the new normal? Like, is this return to old? Like, Will we get back to a better time? Um, I think this feels a bit more traditional venture, yeah. which doesn't feel terrible to me. I think the industry is still healthy. I think it's going through, the world's going through a bit of a rough patch. So this is not a fun time. I think we're bumping along the bottom. I think it should start coming up at some point. You know, I don't know if Jason's right it's back half of 24 yeah. or you're right and it's 2025. At some point, it will come back up. That's you no know, broken clock like me can be right twice a time a day. <laughs> well, listen, if Birkenstock's going public, maybe Jason's right. <laughs> I love my Birks. I do have to say. <laughs> They're very comfortable. 10 years time for Beezer. What would you like then? You've obviously just launched Calster's new program as well. Yes. And I'll, what am I doing 10 years from now? Yeah. Doing this? No, do, this is my, this is, I know it sounds- Do you love this more than ever? Yes. Why? So I started at Sapphire uh, 
gosh, 12 years ago now. And I always thought this is what I wanted to do. But then when you get into the doing of it, no, this is like my life's work. If you said to me, what else do you want to do? I used to kind of think I wanted to be Secretary of State. That is so never, ever, ever <laughs> happening. We tossed that idea out when I was about 24. <laughs> but looked great in the movies. Looked great in the movies. I thought it was a fascinating position for the US government. But now, no, um, like that was said, that was like when college and I was like, what could I be? And then I was like, no, this is definitely about the private world. Can you talk to me about the news with Kelsey's? We mentioned it before and it's been discussed in obviously the media recently. What does that mean and what changes? Yes. So we were very excited. We announced this about two weeks ago that we've taken over the early stage venture fund mandate for Calsters. And what this means, so for folks that aren't familiar with Calsters, they're the world's largest educator pension fund in the world, which is pretty cool. And they've been, to their credit, running an emerging manager program now for decades. And back in the day when they started it, it was a mix of private equity, some healthcare, some venture. And going forward, they now picked us to work with them on the early stage venture fund. And they have pivoted to focus on specialized managers and where they're venture specialists, which means we now are going to take their money, which we're very grateful for them trusting us with, and deploy it into US early stage venture funds, emerging. So that's funds one through three which then adds additive to our existing programs. So the answer is yes, we're deploying more. I think what people don't know about us is we first had a call in, I think it was 2016, and it was at 10 p.m. in London. And I remember I was still living at home with my family, and you needed calls like half an hour for an intro call. And I remember their call ended at like 1, 1 1.15. And I was like, I really enjoyed that call. That was a great call. And we've been friends ever since, which is like eight years, seven years now. I know. I love it. I was young. <laughs> you were you were younger. <laughs> I was much younger. We were all younger eight years thank ago. Thank you for your friendship, and I love doing this. Oh, thank you for your friendship, and thank you for having me.